South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and I Grow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. Okay, audience, here's how we're going to start. First, I'm going to ask, how many here ranch? Okay? How many integrate in the ranching system, their profit systems, and their grazing systems together? Okay, thank you. How many strictly cropping? Raise your hand. How many are government employees of some sort, state, federal, whatever? How many of you are here just for lunch or you're lost? Ah, how about private industry? Mark's private industry. Anybody else in private industry? Consultants, herbicide, fertilizer dealers, anybody else? Okay, great. Now, let's start off with this premise. I'm going to ask you guys a question I asked a group last night. We're talking, and I started to ask this every time I go, because I want us to realize how the premise of agriculture was built on the wrong premise. Here's my question to the audience. How many of you, whether it was your mom, your dad, relative, professor, people that have influenced in your lives said, hey, your job is to farm in nature's image, to work with it, to collaborate with it, to synergize with it, Oh, and this word, nurture it. Not to use control and command to force it, to a be intrusive with tillage, herbicides, fertilizers, and these other tools we use. How many taught you that? Raise your hand. I go everywhere in the country and I ask the same thing. There's a reason for it. Myself, was taught that to force and to control, not to understand it. After eight years of college, that's what I was taught. Why is this coming up now? Ladies and gentlemen, as I travel all over the country, producers are dealing with the stress, financial stress, climatic stress, and the cost of inputs. This movement, this soil health movement, has caused by the costly inputs, the things that drive agriculture. And our farmers and our producers, as we speak, are going broke. And they went broke under my tutelage, some of the ones that I worked in, in Idaho. Let me give you an example, just so you guys get a feeling where I, where I came from. I grew up in New Mexico. I grew up in New Mexico in a very brittle environment, 18 inches north of Santa Fe. Started my career there, went to the southern part as a technician, and then moved to Missouri. So I moved to Missouri, worked there five years, seven years in New Mexico, five years in Missouri. Picked up a wife, Missouri, good way to go. Worked in Oregon, and now North Carolina. By saying, well, that boy can't get a job. But here's where I started questioning where we're at. It's when my producers, one of my producers, my friend, personal friend, is going broke. Could not bring the family, the son, into the operation. I said, something's wrong. Why do we need two or three, four thousand acres to survive? Why can't we survive on a couple hundred acres? Why can't we do that? It knows to me, what I found out is that my producer was destroying the soil in Idaho, great soils cheap water, and still could not bring the sun into the operation. And the worst about it, part about it is, here I went to eight years of school, couldn't help him. I was taught out of context. And what we're gonna to learn today is how to emulate, to farm in nature's image, how to work with it. And I'm gonna select some of you. In fact, this group is pretty darn small, Paul. I'm wondering if we can fit and watch everybody come up here. In fact, we might do that. Okay, the, the people in the last rows, the last three or four rows, I want you to stand up. Come on, stand up. I want you to come and see this demonstration. Stand up. 
Paul and the scribe still do this anyway. But here's my point. I want to show you this demonstration. I'm going to show you about so we're going to talk about soil function and how our understanding and our soils put it in. Come on, come up further. It's coming so far down here. It makes it very, very fragile. We're going to talk about that. Come up here, guys. Come around here. I'm going to select some of you. Al, oh, you look like a guy I'm going to select. <laughs> David, you want to help you out? Come here, guys. Come on, come on. Are you nervous? Yeah, you don't have to speak. That's cool. And, oh, homeschoolers. You got a couple homeschoolers, huh? Come here, guys. You guys going to help us? Do we have a little. You think you can kind of reach this to do this? I think you can, huh? What? Come here, you're going to help us, okay? Jeff, you're going to sit right here. You're gonna, in a little while, I'm going to tell you what to pull right there. You guys get right here. You guys, Al and Dave, you're going to do the aggregate steps, okay? Okay, now, here's the thing. Why were we going broke? Why was my producer going broke? And I can help them. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to talk to you today, I was not taught in college. Even though the information has been around for years and years, it's been there, but it was not taught to us. I don't care how bright, how much years of college you went to, if you have the wrong filters, the wrong map, you still land up going into the wrong destination. Today we're going to get the right map the right filters, the right way of looking at nature. The way we start is this demonstration. I cannot get, I can't even talk to you about grazing. I can't talk to you about zero till. I can't talk about the tools until we understand, okay? Now here's how it's gonna work out, David. Okay? Are you ready? This is called the slink and aggregate stability test. It is one indicator, only one indicator of soil health. There are many indicators. As you go to a doctor, because you're a complex system, they use different sampling. They do blood samples, they do urine samples, they do CAT scans, they do all kinds of indicators, look at all kinds of indicators to determine health, to determine function. These are some of the ones that we're going to use today. You can do this on your operation, you can do this on your ranch, you can do this on your field. It's pretty darn simple. All you do is air, dry the quads, Drop them in water. We're going to explain how this works. This is a zero till, oh, on this one, North Carolina soil, six and a half percent organic matter. This is the neighbor, David. Well, you look like you go get him to do that. David, that's a neighbor, half a percent organic matter. Those are the same soils. Can you guys see them? Can you, let's get this thing going. Okay, we're going to get this going here. Ah. Did you go and put that here? Just move the long cord so because we can show you. So just in case everybody can't see, go ahead and you do that. You know how to get the phone. Come on. We had this all planned out. And then, okay, here, there you go. No, it's the other, it's the other way around. Yeah, there you go. He'll work on that. Okay, now. Now, David. This is our big, beloved South Dakota soil. Uh, Jeff, explain the management on those two. Yeah, don't build uh, soil, and then uh, don't build for 15 years, don't build for a week. Uh, talk about that. The other one is, if you're missing the hill, spring disk operation, corn soybean, all the same soil. In fact, these are not only the same soil, but actually, um, we're, we're collected right across the fence from each other. So the same map we these are cecil sandy clay loams, Piedmont soils, inherently poor soils. They're not wonderful soils. They're not Dakota soils. Okay. Okay, and these are that one's zero till. The native organic matter in North Carolina is three percent. That one's six and a half. Multi-species cover crops for thirty years. He rolls cover crops this high. He's been doing it for 30 years. He no longer uses inorganic nitrogen in his operation. He no longer uses phosphorus. 
He has not used phosphorus in a long time. He has gone down from five herbicides down to one herbicide. He's almost organic no-tip. It's not that he wants to be. You see the color difference? Can you believe those farms are a mile apart? Just a mile apart. It's the understanding is different on these the ways producers. Excellent. Now, let's get ready to drop them in. Now, when I go to an operation, I like to have two mayonnaise jars, or salsa jars with two screens, 15 minute, uh, 30 minute conversation, a shovel, and this demonstration shows me a lot about your operation. Let's go ahead and gently drop in. This is what's going to happen. Water's going to rush in to fill the pore spaces. We don't want it to fall apart. If it starts falling apart, that means it's slaking. Chunks are falling out. The pores are collapsing. No pores, no porosity, no infiltration. Everybody with me? We don't want it to fall apart. We want it to hold its integrity. Let's go ahead and drop them in gently. Let's see what happens in this system. Now is look at the, the soils out. Remember, I tell you, these are inherently poor soils. This is the conventional, this is the no-till. Let's compare. This is what I call a high stress system. Some people, colleges use disturbance. I like the word stress. This is the high stress, this is the low stress. If I took a prairie soil, a native prairie, a native forest, I would drop them, they would be clear. They would not fall apart. This one is starting to fall apart, and it'll, go, it'll get, and see chunks. And when you do the test, you're actually supposed to create some sonification or some disturbance, and they actually scientists will measure that. This one, these two systems are a high stress system. Depending on fertilizer, depending on high weed that have more weeds, bacteria driven system. This is a bacteria driven system. This is a balanced system. This soil, for every 1% of organic matter, will increase your water holding capacity from 17 to 25,000 more gallons. For every 1% of organic matter that you build, you can hold that much more water. Now, here's the thing. The soil food web is not intact in this one. This one's intact. More balance of fungus and bacteria. Now, I have an audience question for the audience. David, why is this system, why is these two systems falling apart? What is the tillage doing to that system? Audience, help them out. We need to understand this. If we do not understand this, how are we ever going to wean ourselves to some of these inputs? Excellent. How do we do that? Now what happens to this system ecologically? What happened? What does tillage do? Speeds up the residue comp decomposition. When you do tillage, you stir up these bacteria, the scientists call our strategists or copotrophic bacteria. They're designed to be in the system. They are there in the system for a purpose. When a cow pie, when residue, they multiply. They're called opportunist bacteria. But when you till, you feed them the house. They eat the organic matter. They eat the glues. They eat the biotic cementing agents that you work so hard to build. So in other words, you cause the soil to cannibalize itself. You stimulate secondary succession. When you run that disc, you wake up those bacteria, they start eating the house. I had an old rancher say, Ray, I'm not gonna stop disking. Because when I disc, I release these nutrients. He's right. After that whole process, the microbes die, they release nitrate. They said, I'm not gonna stop that. I said, yes. You burn the house down tomorrow with a hot dog. Why didn't you just turn the grill on? You just burned the house down. 
So one of them, you not only brought weed seeds to the top of the surface, and you fed the weeds. Weeds love nitrates. They love bacteria dominant soils. This soil is bacteria, bacteria dominant. It cannot handle the stress. It has more prone to disease. It's a total different system. These soils are no longer the same. So let's make this straight. Tillage is not our friend. Tillage is not our friend. Till nature does not till. What does nature use, Phil, as his tillage equipment? The bugs, earthworms, the roots. Biologically, they do it. Earthworms can move 12 to 18 tons of soil in a year for every acre by themselves. And you know what I like about them, Jeff? They don't complain. You don't have to put diesel in them. Earthworms will do the changing. Now look what happens here. Now, I'm going to ask Tanner to break this open. Because you know what people are saying? You can glue them. I'll come to you I bought them in the interim. put a brick in them. I've had people from Missouri tell me that. Do that. Then go here. Ask you if you're safe in the mind. You can now open that up. The water going all the way through, Tanner? They soak all the way through. I don't think so, but they work all the way through. So, yeah, they soak all the way through. You know, you can put these clouds for a whole week and they'll sit there and they won't fall apart. Those biotic glues created by fungus, bacteria, and all the living organisms created those glues. Who makes organic matter? the plant and the organisms. If we take the plant and organisms out, what do we have, audience? If I take plants out and the organisms out, what do you have? Geology. Biology. The moment you say biology, the plant and, and microorganisms is now called soil. Let's go this video. I think you guys should like this one. Okay, so everybody with me? When you stir the soil, you run a disc, you stir up the organisms, and they feed on the house. And some farmers say, what are they on the top? One inch. You don't understand. They're on the top two or three inches. Now let's see the impact of that. This is food coloring. Yeah. You're going to pour into that. Okay, well, that's like, you're going to do the same brother. Enter. Oh, is that your brother's friend? Is your neighbor? That's even better, huh? Good, that's what you're doing. What you're going to do is, this is zero till. This is conventional. This is a low stress system, high tillage. This is a low stress system. More diversity, very low diversity. This is farming like nature. This is what farming will typically do. You ready? We're going to pour, and we're going to see which one allows the water to go through quicker. And set, go. Oh! <laughs> that is a 1,000 year rainstorm. Worked out beautiful. The no-till. How come the no-till allowed the water to go in, Keith? You know why you have name tags? So we can call on you. I want everybody to feel comfortable. I didn't know this years ago. Okay? So what's my book? Okay. So Keith, why is the no-till allowing the water to go in and the conventional not? I thought if you till the soil and get it more fluffy, I would allow more air to go in. Right, Martin? That's what we were taught. You destroyed the biotic glues and the seed and nature to keep the particles and create the pore space. It's called aggregates. The tillage destroys the micro aggregates. I mean, the macro aggregates. It does not destroy the micro aggregates. This one has the macro aggregates. The big pore space is intact. You see the difference now? What's your average rainfall here, 15 or 16? 
I told the EPA, EPA, we do not have a runoff problem. We have an infiltration problem. Think about this. This is only 8 to 10 inches. If it's coming from the sky at 50, 20 miles an hour, what do you think happens then? And you have no aggregate stability. You have no biotic glues. These have been destroyed through tillage off of CO2. Grandpa's farm is up in the atmosphere. Our job is to bring them back and create the glues. Now, we've got another demonstration. You're going to help? Oh, you like this, don't you? Okay, now here, I'll let you guys do this. Let's stand right here. Come here, enter. Jack, you hold that, okay? Or do you want to be the squirter? David, you come, you be the squirter, okay, guys? You're going to hold this. You guys, you come in front of the rain cloud, you like that? Okay, you stand on the other side. Okay, don't move into my hair. This guy's something else. I'll tell you what. Okay, now here, you're gonna stand right here, okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pour, and you're just gonna squeeze right out. Don't take that, don't take the lid off. Okay, we're gonna see what a raindrop does. Okay, you guys see, how many of you have seen big wind, uh, uh, storms of dust? You've seen that, right? You have to experience that here, do you? How come our rivers look like chocolate? This demonstration is going to show you what happens, why they look like chocolate, and why we have dust all over them. What happens when the aggregate gets destroyed. Remember, these glues only last 27 days in a typical agro ecosystem. 27 days. So we have to be building glues all the time. Let's go ahead and make it rain, guys. Let us go to... Oh, look at that. Look at the conventional. We'll raise it up a little bit. Very good. Excellent. Stop there. Excellent. Now let's raise those guys really high. That's good. When the biotic glues are gone, you've tilted. The particles, the clay particles are no longer intact. When it comes and it blows. And the water carries it for miles down the stream. So it's not only stream bank erosion, but the field is taking all these clays, the suspended clay particles of sand, and look at here. Now, guys, which one would you like to drink out of? That one, huh? And it's all in the way you understand the system and the way you farm and your ranch changes the soil ecosystem. Here's the number one thing I want you guys to, to learn today, guys. The soil is alive. It is a living ecosystem. Now you guys want to see another demonstration? Yeah. Let's do one more. Guys, I'm going to let you do this, okay? Here's your corn stock. I'm going to show you the real fertilizer of the soil. Some of us think the real fertilizer of the soil comes in a bag called 4600. Don't we? Uh, that's what we think. We think the real fertilizer is in the bag, don't you stand? I want to show you the real fertilizer. It's called liquid carbon. This is what drives the soil system. This is called the skunk test. What we're going to have these two guys do is I want you to get that and I want you to soak it and move it around like this. Okay, Jack? Without making a huge mess. And you right? You think you do that? Okay, go ahead and dump it in there. Just move it around. You've got to be a little more vigorous. Do that. Excellent. Up and down. Okay, why would plants, you're going to see a scum, you're going to see this little white film. Why would plants give 30 to 50% of their energy to leak these substances? Keep going. You better do a little more. Now you're going to have to get inside of here where you can see the scum. Okay, let's pull this aside. Okay, you see that scum? You guys see that scum? Have a look. Those white films is liquid carbon, glomalian, created by fungus. It is the compounds that leak from the plant. It's got acids in there. There are sugars, proteins, carbohydrates, nucleoside. All these cool chemicals leak into the soil that feed the microorganisms. Why would micro plants leak 30 to 50% of all the energy. Why would they do that? 
is the state of the star. And why would they do that? Kirk, what the heck? Why am I? It's like being taxed 50%. I said, okay, you're going to work for me, but I'm going to give you only 50%. Some of you are saying, what are you talking about? Wait, you really does that. But why would plants give that much energy back to the soil? What do they want out of this? Self preservation? They want nutrients. There's no way we can, plants can pull the phosphorus out of the rock. It's these organisms, it's fungus that release these cool phosphatase that help bring phosphorus out of the rock. They'll bring zinc. These acids that leak make phosphorus soluble. Soils are nutrient deserts. And the way you start this system is with a living plant. Once you understand soils, cover crops are not optional. They are not optional. They are the ones that feed the system and feed the microbes. Everybody with me? It's taking liquid sun, and this is what it is. And it stores it as organic matter. And as the microbes and the plants do this, ladies and gentlemen, everybody with me? If you're not doing this, your system is fragile and is dependent on high chemical inputs. We think it, see, nitrogen is used for protein synthesis, but what really drives the soil is carbon. Carbon, carbon, carbon. Where do we get carbon from, Brent? Plants. Plants, manure, compost, carbon. Soil wants carbon. It doesn't want your fertilizer bag. It prefers this. Everybody with me? Give this guy a hand. Okay, let's sit down. Let's sit down. Any questions about this demonstration? This is why I move my cows correctly. If I take too much from here, I impact this. If you take too much, it doesn't put the energy back. It has to be better just to survive. Awesome. I want to build glue. This is what builds the glues. Oh, by the way, as soon as this goes down a little bit, for grazing, would I graze a cover crop field with no till? or one with conventional. What will happen in this field with no structure? Stan? Beds will get compacted. If I have cover crops and I have the animals there, this one has more structure. People that go to zero till and start using the covers, the no, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, oh, the uh, pivot starts riding on the top of the surface. Okay, we're ready? Okay, let's get going. Is that almost empty right there? Okay. Okay, let's get going. Now you see why I do the demonstrations first? I have to do the demonstrations first. You won't get it any other way. You have to be on the plug from the matrix. And that's what I had to go through that whole experience myself. Come on, computer. Okay. This is one of those days where there we go. Later on today. Okay, maybe we can do this demonstration. We can have two people, a person, what I usually like to do is get a person, the water has a long filter through, get your two fingers, and we'll choose somebody from the audience, and I want you to try and touch the bottom of the plastic. And guess which one will give you more resistance? We'll do that. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Nothing seems to be working today. <laughs> Come on. Gabe, I hope you have a better <coughs> success than I do here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
You know what I'm going to do? Start it over again. I apologize, but uh, my Mac is having a problem. I'm not supposed to be having those kind of things here. Okay, come on. Let's see what happens. Now. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay, these are the seven principles talk about today that you will apply on your operation. These are the seven principles that apply. When I go over the country, these are the filters that I go through, the principles I apply. I want you to focus on principles. When you go from one state to the other state, the principles of ecology still apply, ladies and gentlemen. It does not stop at the border. Every time I hear a part of farmers and ranchers says, Ray, it won't work here. You have soil, don't you? You have living, it's a living ecosystem, isn't it? So the principles apply everywhere. Here's the first one. This is very critical. Understand your ecological and social context. Context, context, context. This is the right map. It's being cognizant of your context. Your ranch, your farm was hewn out of the prairie and the forest. Understand your context and socially, us, we impact the resource. Which leads to this one. This is a new one, Phil. I like this one. And I've noticed that farmers and ranchers in the country apply indirectly these principles called Apply the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Remember that book, Stephen Covey's book? It came out years ago, 10 years ago. I told my, uh, my, my, uh, my brother-in-law, I said, brother-in-law, I need to be more effective. I got too many things on my plate. How do I become more effective? He says, what book would you recommend? He's very well read. He said, I would recommend this book because it gives you the proper context and gives you the integrity to be able to carry out the other principles we're talking about. It is you, it is us who impact the resource. People that are the top ranchers and farmers are applying that, we'll talk about that. Other one is reduce chemical and biological disturbance. Stress. Be careful with your fertilizer. Be careful with your herbicide. Be careful with your insecticides. They cause stress in the system because they're non-selective. You gotta be careful with them. Cover the soil all the time. All the time. Grow a living root. Synergize with diversity. Cover crops and rotation. And the other one that a lot of people can't do is integrate animals. Nature does not farm without animals. Let's talk about the context where we're at. I want you to focus on principles. Ladies and gentlemen, nature is incredibly complex. She is incredibly complex. We would never know all the nuances of it. But if we can follow the principles, watch patterns, then we got it because we know how to operate with it, learn how to work with it, okay? Here's the biggest problem. You have that game, that slide? Do you use that slide? Yeah. This is the big problem right here. It's the way we look at it, our paradigm, our filter. It's the way we look at nature. That's the biggest issue. Here's the other issue. It's difficult to educate a man if his check depends upon it. We have all vested interests. It's my research. It's my form. It's me making, selling inputs. Everybody has vested interests, but we're not looking at the resource. It is hard to teach a man when his check depends upon it. Okay, I'm going to show you about the exposures. We're going to talk about what makes things fragile. Nature is anti-fragile. Our operations are fragile. What I'm talking about is we're talking about exposure in nature. There are fragile exposure, robust and anti-fragile. Most of our farms are in a fragile situation. 
Gabe Brown's farm and ranch is robust, and we'll talk about that. Nature is anti-fragile. It deals with biological and economic systems. It also deals with rules. People that only obey the rules are a fragile people. People that are robust society are principally minded people. But people that have virtue are an anti-fragile people. Same thing with ethics. This works for ecological systems, it works for social systems. People with no skin in the game in our country, where are we at? Do we have skin in the game? Do we have no skin in the game? Or are we a people with soul in the game? Ladies and gentlemen, what makes our farms and ranch fragile is that the majority of us don't have soul in the game. Your souls are not personal to you. We'll talk about that. It has to be personal. This is the journey where we want to mimic. We want to mimic nature's way of doing business. We have some farms and ranches that are here, but a majority are here. And we'll talk about that. Let me talk a little bit about more about fragile and robust. This is a robust system. That is not. Why is an iPad very fragile? Jack? Why is this robust and this is fragile? The principle, this one takes a lot of resource to maintain. It takes a huge infrastructure to maintain it. This one doesn't take much to maintain, does it? How about this tractor? It takes huge amounts of resources, energy, in its component. This is dependent on this huge infrastructure. Here's an Amish hay wagon. This one is more robust. This one is more fragile because it's dependent on a very limited, finite resource called oil. Okay? Now, why should we care? 2012, 60 million, there was in, in China, in 2012, they had a 60 mile pileup. People were stuck in the car for 10 days. And the people in China said, we don't care. We want a car. We want to live like Americans. Our whole agriculture depends on this. It is complicated. It is fragile. I want my farm and ranch to be dependent on my soil. When they have a problem over in um, Louisiana, how long did it take the government to, to get water to the people? Five solid days. How many of you want to put your ranch in operation and depend on the government? Raise your hand. How would you like to be dependent solely on your soil, on your understanding and making it resilient? I, want, I don't want to be dependent on that. And what we're talking about, Gabe and I are going to talk about, is how we can be less dependent on that. That's what makes our system fragile our farm systems. Not only that, because it's driven by this. What kills us is logistics. It's the logistics of the farm and the operation that kills you every day. In the, to win a battle, you have to have the proper logistics. It don't matter if you have all the cool vision and strategy. That is cool. Leaders say, leaders win through logistics. You can have vision, sure. Strategy, yes. But when you go to war, you need to have both toilet paper and bullets. And at the right time, at the right place. In other words, you must win through superior logistics. When you farm too many acres, the logistics becomes complicated. It becomes more costly. It doesn't matter how brilliant your vision is. If you can't get soldiers, weapons, and vehicles, and gasoline, and the chow, and the boots, and the right people, you're going to fall apart. You know what's going to happen to Amazon.com and all these dot-coms? They have a logistic nightmare. It's, it's run by oil and energy. So the thing is, that how do we do our ranch and our operations logistically? We go bring hay, we bring it to the barn, and we're moving it all the time logistically using huge amounts of inputs by the cow who will get the feed themselves. It's how you manage business. 
By the way, Alexander, you know what he used to call the guys, the logistians, uh, are of a humorless lot. They know if my campaign fails, they're the first ones I kill. <laughs> Logistics. How are you dealing with your business, your farming, your operation logistically? This is our, our Achilles heel, water and energy. Huh? Whoop. Don't tell me. We were doing so good. Ah. Our soils, this is when I crossed the country. The soils are naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. This is impacting our whole farming operations. It's changed the climate. It's impacted a lot of our water. It's affected our health. We need to change this. But you can only change it when it becomes personal to you. See, if your soils are not personal, when you go to uh, Dr. Beck's, does Dr. Beck let you dig in the soil without permission? No. It's personal. Those soils are personal to him. You've got to be there. Your ranch has to be personal to you. Your soils have to be personal, not informational knowing. This is what's happened when you have the wrong map, the wrong strategy, the wrong premise. This is Colorado in January 12, 2014. This is 1935. Why are we still there? Look at here. That's Arkansas this year. That is Arkansas. It's amazing. When I showed this to the EPA, I said, EPA, our ranches and farms, our conservation plans here, our rivers and lakes are filled with conservation plans and nutrient management plans. We're good at putting components, but we're not good at systems thinking. Our lakes and rivers are filled with conservation plants, but lacking crystal clear understanding. Our soils are degraded all over the country, all over the planet. Look at the where they're degraded. Very degraded, degraded. Here's what we're going to talk about. It's holism, interconnectedness. Everything is connected on your farm and operation. When you go out there and spray, do you understand that the beneficials keep the, the pest in check? It is ecology. Everything's connected. Plants, humans, all of us. If I could use one word to be emblematic of soil health, it would be one word. It would be called biomimicry. How many of you know what the word biomimicry is? Mark, have you ever heard of that? It's mimic the biology. Mimic nature. I love the way Dean says it. Farm in nature's image. When you get a chance, go on to her, on TED, and type the word biomimicry. It is phenomenal to listen. We have done the biggest technology gains by watching nature biomimicry. 3.8 billion years of research and development, 10 to 30 million species, well adapted solutions. Let's learn from the biology how we can change our operation. Engineer, learn how to do Velcro by mimicking a weed and have the little hook. He made millions of dollars by using the burr to make Velcro. Here's another one, biomimicry. Scientists are using shark skins and they put it on a barge to reduce the friction. By doing this, 2,000 2, tons of fuel are saved by year just by putting and emulating the shark skin and putting it on boats. We are building buildings. This building was done in Zimbabwe, mimicking termite mounds. And the ventilation system, by using that, has saved 90% on air conditioning. Biomimicry. How do we learn how to fly? Gary? Watching the birds. Or what was it because Roger we were smoking cover crops? Probably not. 
Scientists, biomimicry, how do we do this with a ranch? Same way, biomimicry, we're gonna talk about that. Biomimicry has been around for a long time. In the book of Job, it says, ask the beast and they will teach you. The birds of heaven will tell you. It's been in our front of our face for years. Biomimicry. The prairie and the forest. What makes the prairie forest? She argues we should farm like the prairie and the forest. Audience, what is the prairie and forest doing that's so phenomenal? What does it do, Jill? It's better. And then is it covered with diversity? Is there animals in both the systems? Absolutely. Look how complex it's some of the systems it does. It's self-maintaining. Predator insects, the beneficials control themselves. It's self-renewing. It's self-organizing. It does all these services that we talk about. Oh, by the way, my slide got messed up here. You're probably saying, well, Ray, where did you make this up? Although applications and principles of patterns from nature and agriculture are well recognized, but they're rarely applied. All the researchers, sorry about the slide. All kinds of researchers have been thinking this for years. Let me give you an example here. Look at here, 1961. I was born in 1961. This is the range in Las Cruces, New Mexico. This is the way it looked in 1961, short steep prairie. Look what happens when we overgrazed and used the wrong tools. It went from here to here. And then guess what BLM and the Forest Service did? They say, hey, let's take the cows out. We did a shift. We did a regime shift. This is how I like to think about this in natural systems. Think of this as a giant basin. This is the energy fields that are controlling and moving the natural system. It is the food web, all the complex ecosystem services. This ball represents nutrient cycling, water cycling, all of these complex elegant systems in the background moving all these. It shifted from here to here. When it shifts like that, ecologists call this a regime shift. It crossed this threshold. And it went from here to here. And a good natural system, the bottom of the basin is equilibrium. This system is more resilient towards drought, better at nutrient cycling, better for the water cycle, all of these services we talk about. This one shift completely different structure. It shifted. It was done through the management. By not managing the cows correctly and the animals, it shifted from this basin to this basin. And it's hard to bring it back here. Once it goes to here, it is di difficult. What is that? Mesquite. Those are mesquite. You know mesquite are nitrogen fixers. Look how much bare ground how it shifted. And because we need to manage the biology, the microbes. Same thing with the system here. This one here, notice how big the basin is. The bigger the basin, the more resilient it is. The smaller the basin, the less resilient. This one is resilient. Our farms and ranches are less resilient. It crossed the threshold. Why? This system is low stress, high diversity, high human inputs, high low human inputs, high functioning ecosystem services. Our operations are high stress, low diversity, high human inputs, disrupted ecosystem services. Let's take it down to the soil level. Our soils, most of us do not realize our soils were like this. They have shifted here. This system is different from this system. You cannot compare good no-till systems with a conventional system. They're total different regime shifts, total different system, total different animal. This one is bacteria dominant. This one has all the soil food web intact. This one does not. 
This one cannot handle droughts. This one's leaky. It is a different threshold. It passed a different threshold. And let's talk about how that happens when we don't manage things properly. Look at this when you don't even manage the way you put your equipment out. Non-disturbed, low disturbance drill, high disturbance drill. Look at the disc arrow, or will plow. Why she would care. But look at the difference when you manage and you do things correctly, even with a drill. How does it affect, especially in these systems? Look at this one here. Look at the CO2. Look at the evaporation, the water evaporation. Just by that little bit of disturbance, how it impacted that soil. How do we have sandy soils on your farm and ranch? Hey, how do we increase the cation exchange capacity on these soils? That is an aggregate of sand done by, fused by biology. See the color right here? That is sand that is coated by those organomineral complexes. Now, that aggregate can regulate temperature, pH, make it potential. Now I have better cation uh, uh, electric conductivity. I have better cation exchange. This was done biologically. Those sand particles now are coated. I have seen in North Carolina this really dark film with cover crops and no till. One tillage event will destroy that aggregate. One tillage event will destroy that aggregate. And the organisms will eat the glues and take the coatings off that. This is what we want. That is an aggregate. I fully appreciate the now, let's show you what happens when you don't have proper aggregate like stability. This, so you really need to be out here during the most intense thunderstorm of the year. Since most people aren't willing to do that, this is taken by Virginia. This is a rain simulator. This is Chris Lawrence. Look what happens when the aggregate's destroyed. On the right, we start with a slice of intact surface soil from a long-term no-till field. This soil is not only protected with a mulch of cover crop residue, it also has a stable porous sponge structure. Now, years ago, as a kid, I remember, you know, you'd get these, these big, heavy thunderstorms in the summer, and it would just, it would just wash the field, and you'd end up with, with mud down the road. And I'm talking about mud that you'd go over there with the skid loader and scoop out of the way so the cars could go down the road. What I'm seeing now is I'm seeing these heavy rainfalls, and I'm barely seeing a trickle coming out of the field. After we simulate an extremely intense thunderstorm for five minutes, the differences are obvious. Most of the water we apply to this soil has run off into this jar, carrying away with it a thin but very significant layer of topsoil. It's about a dime's thickness, 10 to 15 tons of soils eroded per acre. Now look what happened here. We have a very intense rainfall to this bare tilled soil. Inch and a half. Obviously we harvested very little for future plant use. What happened? The biotic glues are gone. This no-till soil has absorbed virtually every drop of water we apply. What little ran off is clear. The bottom line is pretty simple. If you want to harvest more rain like these no-till farmers are doing, keep your soil covered on top and make it a sponge underneath. Let's look at our rangeland. How about a range and grass and pasture land? <laughs> Look at the overgrazed. These pasture samples were collected from actual pastures just down the road from each other. One represents continuous overstocked and overgrazed pasture. The other represents a rotationally grazed and aggressive pasture. All rainfall runoff is funneled into a collection jug on the front of the demonstration table. This allows us to visually compare both the volume and clarity of the runoff. 
most important nutrient we have to manage is water. Uh, with rotational grazing, particularly during the summer, we have more water infiltration because we have a better cover on the ground. Essentially, the cover intercepts the water particle and allows it to enter into the ground versus running off. Now, I want you to observe what's going on here. Look how much ran off. See how much more runoff occurs on the continuous overgrazed pasture versus the well rested rotation grazed pasture. Here you can see how much more water actually soaks in and absorbed under the rotation of grazed well rested pasture and how much more water actually runs off the continuous grazed pasture. Okay, why did it do that? If I, if I drop it into an aggregate, if I drop an aggregate right here of that pasture and drop it in here, would it fall apart or not? It wouldn't fall apart. So what's going on here? NRCS? Yes. Are you an NRCS at some point? No, Terry. Terry, what's going on? Daddy, what's going on, Daddy? What's going on? Why is there so much running off in the pasture? What do you think is going on, guys? Structure. And what happened? Structure. Structure. Did it? Is the structure impacted? I wouldn't deny that. How about when the rain comes like this? Ten to fifteen, twenty miles an hour. How are you slowing the raindrop down? I drove 850 miles uh, a couple of weeks ago, go to Missouri to go look for a farm. Do you know what I saw? Majority through the country, as I travel, this is what I see. And then we wonder why, are we creating our own droughts? <coughs> How about a rangeland? It, looks the same. it does the same thing. Oh, by the way, hayland. This blows my mind, right, Gabe? You've seen this consistently. Even if hayland is that tall, the water runs off. Why does Hayland do that? I cannot explain it. I know we're taking too much, we're taking all the carbon, we're taking the phosphorus, we're taking the calcium. Hay is probably the most extractive thing you do on the farm in the operation. I don't know if it's sucking the energy from the aggregates around it, I don't know, but the water continually runs off on Hayland. It just blows my mind. Okay, how many of you guys use this tool? Oh, Gabe, okay, I hope this doesn't do this to you. Okay, here's what I'm gonna pass this. I'm gonna skip some of the biology because I think some of you have already, because of time. I'm having such a headache with this thing, come on. Okay. Okay, here we go. When I dig in the soil, I want to see all this present. Go to your ranch, go to your operation. You need to see every one of these spheres present on your operation. When I get a shovel full, I want to see earthworms. I want to see at least four to five earthworms per shovel full. That means you have 850 to a million and a half earthworms per acre. They will move 18 tons of soil in an acre. Yeah, in 27 years, they will completely turn over the whole six inches of your farm and your operation. I want to see aggregates. That's the house. That's the cottage cheese. I want to see lots and lots of cottage cheese on your soil. I want to see in the cottage cheese will be pores. I want to see roots. I want to see all that present. And I want to see residue. In healthy soils, you will see residue on the surface. In conventional systems, you will not see cottage cheese, you will not see the residue. Why? Because it's still and destroyed. It's gone. This is why I move the cows correctly. Because of them. Not just for the cows. You need to understand the micro herd. We left them out. Because we manage this elegant universe. Now what happens when you 
till that system. This soil is a subaquatic ecosystem. It works on water. Look how beautiful. That is a system of aggregates put together to create underground caverns. What does tillage do to that? Eric, when I run the disc, what the heck did I do that, baby? You messed that up. Oh, but I'm just going to disturb it a little bit. How about here? These are the guys that, these are protozoa. Protozoa, when they eat a bacteria, the moment you put those living roots, protozoa and nematodes eat bacteria. They, when they do that, they release ammonium. You can get anywhere from 17 to 116 pounds of N a year just for those suckers eating the bacteria. Did we ever calculate that in our nutrient budgets? They release ammonia. People worry about where nitrogen comes from. It comes from the microorganisms, predation from the atmosphere. Okay, we're gonna skip that. Okay, we have an ability to measure this. We now have a new soil test. You need to write this down. Dr. Ray Ward runs the Haney test. You have to ask this for specifics. We now have the ability, I call it the blood sample of the soil. Dr. Wayne Glasky used to say, the soil solution, the warain, when it goes into the soil, is the soil solution, carries all these carbon compounds. Organic matter is 12,000 parts per million carbon. We now have the ability to measure the food. Soil organic matter is the house, the structure. This is what we're measuring, is the food that drives the system. Why do I care about that? You can have 10% organic matter soils and still the soils are not functioning. It's like living in a big house and you eat hot dogs every day. Life still sucks. Just because you have a lot of organic matter does not mean that they're healthy. We have some soils in California that are 10% organic matter and they till them and they till them and they still have a lot of organic matter, but they have very little food. The Haney test has the ability to measure now for years and years with our current university soil test, we only picked up this pool of nitrogen. Now the Haney test picks up this other pool of nitrogen. One of our producers doing the Haney test saved $60,000 on nitrogen cost by one soil sample. Now we're able to pick up the other pools. It's called the Haney test. Do it like a regular university soil test. You have to ask for it specifically. Okay? Look at the difference when you do the Haney test. This was done in Mississippi. This is poor no-till, corn and soybean, conventional tillage, no-till, cover crops, pasture, forest, in a very hot and humid soil. This is the university soil sample, nitrate nitrogen. This is the Haney test. In poor no-till, it said you only had 11 pounds. The Haney said, no, you got 15 pounds. Conventional, look at the difference. Now look what happens after two years of cover crops. Two years of cover crops at no-till. University soil sample says you only have 2.5. Haney says, no, you got 15 pounds of N. It's picking up all the organic pools of N that the organisms can utilize and the plant. Plants can take up amino N. They can take up organic forms of nitrogen. Look at the pasture, 4.74. University, Haney says, no, you've got 75 pounds of N. Look at the forest. University soil sample says 11. No, the Haney says you've got 70 pounds of N. Does that make a huge difference? Here's the takeaway. We have new science. You know what this solid science, you know what this test is based on? Biomimicry. Our old university soil samples are based on these acoustic acids, like the malic and bright. This is based on root exudate acids. The acids from the plant. Water. What do plants and what does the soil see? It sees water and root exudates. 
Why am I excited about this test? Because it's based on the right premise. Look at the difference here in that soil that fell apart, 160 parts per million of that labile carbon. Race tires is 347. Look at the difference. We now have the test. As the higher it goes, the better the aggregation. How much time do I have? I'm almost out. Thirty. I got thirty more minutes. Okay. Now, what is the most limiting nutrient? What does everybody say that we've been taught in agronomy? How many agronomists? Raise your hand. Agronomists, raise your hand. <coughs> Nobody wants to claim it. Agronomists. What did they tell us the most limiting nutrient in the soil since we were indoctrinated? Nitrogen. It is carbon. Nitrogen is used for protein synthesis to process carbon. Microbes want food. Carbon is the food. See the difference? Carbon. You get the carbon cycle right, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, everything comes right. Let me show you how powerful carbon is. This was taken in the back of the desert of my uh, buddy, Rudy Garcia, state agronomist. Look at the soil in Albuquerque. You've been to Albuquerque. Look how dry. Does that look like some of the soils here? Eight inch precept, okay? That looks pretty dead. Look what happens when you put one inch chips of wood chips on the top of the surface. One inch of wood chips. Look what it did to the soil. Look at the dark layer. It blows away what one inch of wood chips did to that soil. It did this. That green, that turned green, that shrub. Watermelon came out because he had watermelon seed because he was trying to get his garden. But that one inch of wood chips that took it to fungal driven system changed the way that whole soil desert, that desert soil functioned. That one inch of wood chips made that huge of difference in his whole system. He could not get anything to grow back there, but that one inch of wood chips made that much difference. That carbon, that four-winged salt brush, it turned green and blossomed. It was beautiful. Look at the difference where it had no wood chips and where it had wood chips. Carbon is so powerful. That's what, that precious one inch there's a difference between life and death in our farms and operations. Look how powerful animals are. I want to run animals at a very high density. Why do I want that? Jack, why do I want to run my cows like buffalo? Why do I get, why would I care about running them and grouping them so tight? Uh, it's my impact. I want to run animals just like nature does. Why? Because I want a cow high a foot apart and I want urine to feed microbes, to stimulate the nutrient cycle, to get the water cycle to work. If I have a cow high here and I work vets at, it's not going to work. You have too much bare ground in between to prime the soil. Look what happens when we move that herd like that. We in our range ground and our pastures are understocked, overgrazed. I want that. If the cows are not good that tight, you're not going to get the nutrients and water cycling. You're not going to build aggregates. You're not going to feed microbes. Look at the difference here. In the Chihuahua Desert with eight inches of precept. Some of you said, well, I got 15. This is, it doesn't get more brutal and hot than this place. Look what happens with continuous grazing and 15 years without cows. Do you see any difference? Let's look at another vintage point. See any difference with cows and without cows? Not much, right? Look what happens when you herd them and you focus on the microbes and you understand what you're doing. Look at the mesquite dying and the grass is coming back and you're bringing ecological memory back. Look at the cat that's being choked out. Just by understanding the cow.
cows and the urine and the carbon and the, what you're doing and grouping the cows tight. Well, how it impacts that system. It's where the eight inch preset. We have had ranches go from here to here. Now the water cycle starts working again. Water cycle's not working because the carbon cycle is screwed up. Let's see about the covers. How many of you have seen that? How many of you know what that is? Come on, audience, engage. It's a sprayer with a cover crop seeder. Look at that. A ladder for another ladder. That is awesome. That is for standing. That is a cover crop spreader, seeder, for standing corn. Why would operators, why would producers spend that much money to do that? Because they understand soil function. Look at here. That is elaborate. Look at this one. Isn't that cool? How would you like to drive that one? This is why. Because when they harvest their corn, you're feeding microbes and you have a living cover. We have people that are cutting down their variety. Instead of growing 110 day corn, they're growing 95 day corn. Because every day is precious. And until you treat your cover crop like your crop, you're never going to change your soils. Until you go to rotational diversity, until you understand how powerful diversity and the living plant. This makes the plant one. This, the soil and plant one. The plant and soil are one. Look at this cedar here. Again, you see boxes are harvesting, you're dropping cover crop seed. Indiana, it's cold, and they say we don't have time. That's the argument I hear all the time. How about this guy here? Lucas Griswell. This guy's amazing. He farms soils this deep. Pennsylvania, highly eroded, huge, steep slopes. This year, last year, he did 850 acres and he planted no-till corn right into standing cereal rye that high. Look at his slopes. You want to see how steep his farm is? He planted the corn right into the cereal rye. Neighbor said his, his dad just fought with him and said, Lucas, don't do this. You're going to have army worms. You're going to have all these problems. You're going to have disease. You're not going to get stand. It's a disaster. Don't do it. He's been no tilling for years. He got sick and tired of the erosion that he was losing his soils. Because as you go to no till, the soils get softer. Now he's doing green planting. He's capturing solar energy to the last minute. Pennsylvania, where it's cold and wet. Look how his corn popped right out of that. 190 bushel corn with soils this thick. Fragile pits right on the bottom. He's using bio, he's using diversity, multi-species cover crops. We are excited what he's doing. He came to listen to game and learn. These guys came to North Dakota. We're doing cover crops this way. We're rolling it down with an old culty packer. And our corn pops right out of that thick mulch that high. Our cotton growers are spreading cover crop seed as they're defoliating. Look how thick, how much carbon we want out there. That's why race dyer soils are six and a half percent organic matter. In a hot, humid area when microbes are eating all the time. He's been doing this for 30 years. Multi-species mixes. Look at the corn pop out of that heavy mat. Remember I was showing you, I want a detritus sphere. I want to see aggregates. When you pull that, pull that back, the soils are cooler. They're protected from the rain impact. Look at the weeds being suppressed by a cereal rye, aleopathic effect, smothering. Pigweed hates cereal rye. Russian thistle does not like cereal rye. I know cereal rye is a bad word here. In some cases for our wheat guys. Look at the difference in temperature. 92, 77, side by side. Holding the mason yesterday.
You can use an old cultivator, or you can plant right straight into it. Here's how you plant into it. Really, really green, or really, really brittle. But you don't want the in between when it's rubbery, you should arrive because then you'll have problems with the drill, the hair pitting. Really green, really crunchy. We do it right away. We plant it, you can either roll it, or you can plant right straight into it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Now, how, yeah, and see, here's the thing that we, we all broke with, is how do we get cover crops to work in a very brittle and fragile environment? I have come to the personal understanding that you cannot make that work without having a perennial system and having animals in the system. Let's look at your natural system. It was a prairie. It was a grazed system. It is very, very fragile. Some of it should have not been farmed to begin with. So here's what I'm saying is, and you can remember, it's only through the plant can we build organic matter in the land room. There's no other way. You have to grow carbon. So you have to change your whole system to make it work. I don't think you can just grow cover crops and say, I'm going to make it work. When you bring animals now, I can raise the animals, make money while they're being grazed. Let me give you an example. If you have a thousand acres of wheat, why do we plant every acre into wheat? Why don't you just take 250 acres, grow a multi-species cover crop, let it be grazed, and bring the wheat back again into the system? You see what I mean? Because we're going to have a water issue. Our soils are degraded, and they can't handle. They can't. They don't hold any water. Most of the water runs off. They don't have the organic matter. They don't have the structure. They don't have the biology. So it's a systems approach. So I just can't say it's going to cover crop. Cover crop in itself is not the magic bullet. Yes, understanding the system. That's why we, we, we failed. Some of the part of Western Kansas is very brittle, and you have to manage carbon and be more careful. You cannot. Here's what the beautiful example for grazing. When we're grazing in the western part of Kansas, how much carbon do we take? We take all of it. We eat that much. When I'm farming in North Carolina, I can afford to take more carbon off. It is less brittle. Your part of the country, you can't afford to make mistakes. One mistake will set you back out five or ten years. You took too much. That's the difference between those two areas. You've got to make it one. Compaction. How many of you have compaction issues? Compaction. You saw that last night, didn't you? Is that a compaction issue? That's a pretty darn serious compaction issue, isn't it? So how do we fix our compaction issues? Eat. You get the big tractor out, don't you? I want to rip that baby. You want to go right into that, right? I got right into that compaction layer. Well, how is that plant surviving that compaction layer? Audience, how is it doing that? Is it magic? Is it Photoshop? The biology is incredibly powerful. These plants are mycorrhizal. These mycorrhizal can release these powerful enzymes, dissolve some of the rock. Bacteria can dissolve rock. They can bring the nutrient. It's the biology that brings. These plants leak acids. They can bring the nutrients out. It's the biology. It didn't do it by itself. I took that in Hawaii, Mr. Beck. Dwayne, I took that in Hawaii. Look at that. You know what that's growing out of? That is a plant growing out of solid rock lava. How did it do that? How did that, how did these trees grow in two-inch soil and most of it's rock? The biology and the bacteria and all these organisms modify the system. Here's a website you need to go on to. It's called Niche Construction. Scientists say the biology modifies the physical. Beavers modify their environment. You modify your environment. You go out and turn the furnace on. Modify it. I've got four minutes. 
Look at the architecture. We want to mimic this architecture, ladies and gentlemen. This is the architecture we want to mimic. We want to get away from this system and go to this system. What's lacking right here? Cows. We want to go from here to here. Then you get synergy. We need to cover the gaps here. This is where our, great, uh, our systems are annual. We have leaks here. Leak, leak. We want to cover it all the time. Look at here, De Brent. This is called, he is planting corn into his cover crop. In the early spring, he is capturing solar energy to the last moment. He planted this in the fall. He made sure that cover was there and he plants it right into it. And he's got, and his covers look like that. It is very competitive for land at Dave's place. Farmers, the ladies, the widows come say, Dave, can you farm my place? Because it's so beautiful. He has turned his soils from here to here. Biomimicry, agroecology principles. Look at his soils now. They used to be yellow. They're this color. The microorganisms modify them. They change them, them and the plants. Now he's growing soybean with no herbicide. That soybean has produced 68 bushels into standing uh, rolled cereal rod. No herbicide. Look at his yields response. This during the drought, eight inches of rain. Ohio, only you guys get drought. The whole summer, Ohio in 2012 only got eight inches where you lived. Corn produced 140, the neighbors produced 40. Covers, biology, organisms, understanding. Fragile, robust. Covers, we want our covers to look like this. Now I'm bringing ecological memory. This is what we're doing with the covers. When we do that, then these guys come. Then the beneficials come. And the beneficials regulate the pests. They take care of it. You just gotta plant it. It's pretty darn simple. Let me wrap it up. Let me go to the last slide here. Because I'm, I always do this, too many slides. But, um, this system here, let's go to right here, the last one. Let's make it good. That's possible. I've almost got to the end there, game. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our understanding that makes our system either going to be robust or fragile. When I look at the, all the systems, I always look at your farm and ranch from an energy perspective. This carbon is what drives the system. Is your, is your operation running on ancient sunlight or is it running on new sunlight? Is it driven by biology or is it driven by chemistry? Now folks, I don't want you guys walking away thinking that I'm opposed to fertilizers or herbicides and those things. I am not opposed to those tools. But understand the more you are addicted to these tools, the more fragile your operations are. I want you to be robust. And here's how you make it robust. You need to be ecologically and financially diverse. You need to stack operations. Gabe's going to talk to you about it. The more you run sheep, you run cows, you run, you sell chickens, you sell eggs, you sell all that. You're doing what nature does. Nature does not put all her eggs in one basket. She is diverse. She is diverse. It's the principles. It is the principles. I'm applying them all. Here's the book that I was talking to you about. My last 
We cannot fix the ecology. You cannot have ecological integrity without human integrity. I'm sorry, you're not going to fix it. It's the way we look at the system makes it fragile. It's the way we do business. I bought this book recently. I read it about 10 years ago, didn't get it. I bought it again because I realized how much I'm missing the mark. If you want to change your operation, you have to change you. You have to change the way you look at things. Then your operation will change. You cannot separate the two. They're intertwined and intermingled. You cannot separate them. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to spend some time here. These are the principles. I cannot go through all these ones. You read that book. It is well worth it. I don't care if you are Mormon. I don't care if you're Christian. I don't care if you're Buddhist. It doesn't matter. These are self-evident principles that very effective people apply. You apply those principles, then you can fulfill the other set of principles, because then you'll stick with it. Thank you, folks, for your time. There's six labs, up. there's six or seven labs. There's uh, Woodhead Laboratory, in Maine. Type the Haney test, I, I use the Woodhead Laboratory in Maine. They do, they do a really nice sheet. This training, really, like last night we talked about it, but just to talk about the test and understand it, it's why like a two, three, four hour, it's like a day training, just to understand it. You teach it right, and you have the right context for your humanity. Ray loves it, there's a, uh, there's four, five, six other labs that do it. Do you remember another one, Paul? But there's five. Gabe, do you remember another, any of the other labs that do the Haney test? Uh, Wood lab. Uh, Wood's in. Uh, there's four, five, six other laboratories that do it. And it's growing. But the results, we have 6,000, 7,000 samples. NRCS is supporting this, this test. This is Dr. Rick Haney from ARS. This has gone through a 15 peer review research. Some of the science has been around a long time for that. Finally, we have a test now that can really help us a lot. And it's just the beginning of this test. It's just the beginning. I'm sure it's going to go through more development. Some more questions. H A N E Y. Dr. Rick Haney. You type in there and he'll come out. Dr. Rick Haney. He'll come out. He's in Texas. It is a wonderful, we have been very, very pleased. Now I feel much more comfortable. I'm not saying don't use the university test. You compare it. But a lot of our producers are using it. I had two producers in North Carolina reduced half their fertilizer cost. But they've been no-till. One has been no-till for three years. This year his average yield in North Carolina was 220 bushel corn. And his neighbors, the average of the county is 110 with half the fertilizer. We use the Haney test. Yes, sir. Yes. Haney can be Haney is Haney destructive to the soul. Yes. Why? You take all the carbon. You take phosphorus. You take calcium away from the system. Now, how do we fix it? Bring the animals, graze it, give it some manure, bring some diversity back into the system. Give it back to the system. It's tough to get some of our haters to understand that. They remove everything. If you can bring grazing, don't take so much carbon. Like some of our alfalfa guys, I said, hey, why don't you mix some clovers, mix some uh, grasses in there, bring in some diversity, different leakage of exudates. Bring the cows in there. Let them graze. If you don't have cows, let the neighbors graze your hay field. Don't take the last cutting. Give back. That's tough. Yes, sir. So running our cows. It's helpful. Oh, absolutely. The reason hay fields only last three to five years, they go through a system called soil toxosis. I can never, I used to raise hay. I could not figure why I can never get five or seven years out of hay. Pure hay. So, 
According to some of the Russians, they said that there was a bacteriophagi virus that attacked the nodulators, and they would kill the nodulators and they would poison themselves out. Nature does not want to see the same root by itself after year after year. So it wasn't the, the lack of fertility, it was the fact that he went through soil toxosis. Peaches will do the same. Nature does not want to see the same root year after year. It wants diversity. So you can improve the alfalfa scan by bringing in more plants, manures, urine, grazing it, compost, those help. Thank you.